Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to disassemble the oldest home computer on eBay, this 1977 Kim 1. It's got a backplane stuffed full of custom boards, and I really have no idea yet what's all in here, so let's find out together. The boards appear to be stacked from top to bottom, roughly in order of their importance and frequency of use. We'll start at the top, then, with the Kim 1 itself. Three major ICs, 1K of RAM, and a keypad for input. There's one repair on the back to correct a cut trace on the other side, and otherwise it's largely original. As you can see, there are three major ICs, 40-pin DIP packages on the front of the board here that are a 6502 and two 6530s. Expansion port A on the screen far left here is connected primarily to the 6502, whereas the 6530 is connected to the bottom expansion port. The second 6530 is dedicated largely to the keypad, the LEDs, and to any TTY input and output circuits that are added on at a later date. And now up at the top of the board, we see eight static RAM chips. Each chip serves one bit. So when you read one byte from a particular memory address, it actually is served by the eight chips all at once. This board has a 20 milliamp current loop interface, more akin to driving TTYs such as the ASR33 Teletype, but with a simple board from Corsham you can adapt it to run vanilla RS-232. The first thing we'll notice on the back of the board is this little blue wire which actually connects two points on the board that would be connected by traces on the front of the board that had previously been cut in order to facilitate the TTY circuit. And next down the mighty stack is the MTU Visual Memory Board. This is a board basically a CRTC circuit on an entire board before they had been reduced to a single chip. Looks like it is primarily a bunch of RAM and then some decode logic in order to expose that RAM on the bus somehow. There's also a few patches on the back here, but nothing very major. Maybe two jumpers and a couple capacitors. On the front side of the board, we can see there are a lot of RAM chips and it works out to 8K of RAM actually. That small sticker which says A0 to BF, I suspect, is where this is actually mapped into system memory, probably up with A000. The little audio connector here is actually a video out connector, and it's just ground and video signal, and everything else is muxed onto it in terms of sync. The 8K of RAM on this board appears to be made up of National Semiconductor 5280Ds, static RAMs of course, and that's a little surprising because most of the other memory in here is made by MOS. These 74LS109s, I believe, are flip-flops. I couldn't tell you what they're doing, other than flipping and flopping. After CPU and quote-unquote GPU, what's the next piece of hardware we need to run the system? Well, in this case, it's a disk controller. This board is just, just a mass of chips. It's got one big 40-pin dip, and then the whole thing looks to be intermediate-sized dip packages that... Whoa... On the back, it's just a web of wires that really scares me that this really will ever work again, but I guess it worked at some point in the past, so hey, if it's not broken, it should still work. Now, it's a pretty safe bet that there'll be a disk controller chip of some kind on here because I don't think there's enough circuitry here to build a disk controller. There's no ROMs that I can see, so in fact, we've got a D765C, which is in fact an NEC disk controller chip for 8.5 inch Shugart floppy drives. I think it'd be really cool to get this board up and running again, so I've actually been searching for an 8-inch uh, Shugart floppy drive. So if you've got one hiding under your bed that you're not using, but you know works, because I don't want to have to troubleshoot the drive too, uh, please consider donating it to the cause here, and I'll see if I can get this disc controller actually running with an old Shugart 8-inch floppy. Now, the power systems on this board are somewhat confusing to me. They, they take a higher voltage coming in, and then they step it down to 12 and to 5. And each board needs both 12 and 5. Some of these boards I can see from the RAMs need 5 and 12. Why this board needs it? Probably for the disk drive, I'm guessing. But uh, each board has the option of apparently generating its own 5 and 12 or not. There's no universal bus of 5 and 12. Now, I'd love to know the story on this wiring on the back because this board is not some homebrew thing the guy ginned up himself. It's actually a product from MTU, the manufacturer of most of these boards but this seems to need an inordinate amount of bulging around on the back side. It's got uh, resistors plugged in here, it's got capacitors, it's got about a dozen or more wires. 
So if you think Windows Update sucks now, imagine back in the days when manufacturers were sending out hardware jumper traces that you had to add month to month in order to keep your board current with the current state-of-the-art in disk controller technology. Next up are two boards that look rather identical from the end profile, so we'll have to get them out and see if they actually are similar or not. Here is the first one. It looks like somebody's playing Farmville and decided only to raise chips and capacitors. I'm not sure what's going on. It looks like a lot of RAMs and then a whole bunch of decoding logic. And in fact, according to the label, it's a 16K RAM expansion. On the back side, it's almost refreshing in that there are no interconnects or extra bow wires. Let's pull out the second board and we'll get a look at how similar they are or are not. Try to be careful because the static electricity is really not kind to these. And yeah, I, I think they're largely similar. Some of the chips are different, but the order and the missing chip here appears the same. At least I think so. I have to look at that a little closer. Now, if there's anything Bill Gates taught me, it was never to name drop. But a couple days ago, I was talking to Albert Charpentier, and he's the guy that uh, designed the SID and the VIC chips, the VIC-1 and the VIC-2 for the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. And he was at MOS, back in the 76-77 era when these chips were designed. And I was showing him these over a, over a FaceTime link and he saw the board and he goes, holy cow, those are my chips. Now, to be honest, I forget exactly which chips he was looking at when he said that, but it was, I believe, one of these boards. At first I was concerned about this empty socket, but if you look at the other board, it's also empty in the same place. So I'm hoping it's by design. Each of these boards is populated with 16K of static RAM in two 8K banks and it is mapped into memory at an address I don't know exactly where this one maps into, but... Now you'll notice these boards only have a top edge connector, but that's all they need because that gives us access to the CPU's address bus. So that enables this board to respond when it's being decoded from the address bus and it sees its address range as active. There's a set of jumpers on here that I believe allows you to configure where in memory it happens to appear, and I bet these appear at 2000 and 6000, roughly 16k apart. My not really OCD caused me to straighten out a bunch of these capacitors, so they're nicely in a row, but they're still not as straight as I would like them. But I don't want to bend anything and break it, so on to the next board. This next board, as you can see, is going to be a little half board, which is actually only connects to the address ports. And it has basically a prototyping board with a bunch of wire wrapping on the back that interconnects all of these chips. Unlike the other boards in the system, this one is completely handmade and completely hand-wired. I really don't have any idea what it's for. I would have assumed it would be a floppy disk controller of some kind, given the type of cable that's attached to it, but given that the system has a floppy disk controller, it's unlikely to be that. If it were a hard drive MFM controller, I'd expect two cables. Now, as always, I need to give the disclaimer that I'm a software guy in a hardware world here, but these major chips all seem to be the same. They're labeled as DP8212N, which I believe is an 8-bit input-output port. The 7408s are just little logic chips, and I'm not really sure what this is doing. It must provide some way for the CPU to talk to the I.O. lines that come out this cable and go to this edge connector. How it all works, I'm not entirely sure. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments in the comments section or on the Discord server so we can chat about what the heck this board is. What does it do? There is a catalog number, 276152, but I believe that's going to be for the prototype board as a blank and nothing to do with the actual circuit that's on it today. On the back side of the board, we can see all the basic traces that are done with uh, not wire wrapping. Or is it wire wrapping? Yeah, they're also soldered, so maybe you solder after you wire wrap? Uh, that's before my time. This board is an impressive little bit of construction. It would have taken a lot of time to get this right, I would think. Not that I have any idea what it's doing, of course, but it probably did it well. Probably my first approach will be to figure out which pins it's using from the address and from the control bus and see what it's kind of doing with those and what it might be doing with them and see if I can figure out what's going on from there. Now this next board is actually probably the simplest in the system. It's just a prototyping board and the only thing it has on it is a couple of power regulators to generate these uh, regulated 5 and 12 volts. It's got a big cap on there for filtering and otherwise it's strictly made up of heavy duty traces that run up and down and interlocked interleaved rails so that you can access both the 5 and the 12 uh, from a dip package. Probably the real utility in this board, besides it providing regulated power, is that it has access to all of the address pins on both the top and the bottom expansion ports. That would allow you to build pretty much anything that you can conceive of with dip packages. 
Now, because this board has access to both all of the address and data pins, as well as the I.O. pins from the second 6530 chip, you can imagine it could act as sort of an I.O. bridge where your I.O. pins do something that winds up showing up on the address and data bus. What that is, I don't know, but you could build pretty much anything. As you can see, it's got an MTU part number in the corner there, 11 little dashes, all zeros, it looks like. Now, I would say it's this last board that actually, other than maybe the visual memory, intrigued me the most because it's got a ZIF socket, it's got EEPROMs, it's got empty slots, it's got big 40-pin controller chips, it's got a bit of everything, tons of dip switches. Just two little bulge wires on the back here, so not too much after-the-fact correction. You can see there's a ZIF socket on here, and I believe that is actually the EEPROM that you're going to program. The switch next to it is likely the high voltage source, so you can turn that off and on as needed. Down here you can see there are some purple EEPROMs with gold window frames, and I'm guessing that those are actually the software that you need to operate the PROM burner. I'm assuming these 6820Ps are interface adapter chips, by which I mean they map themselves into an address space, into a few bytes, expose their registers, and then by poking memory and data into their registers, you can control which pins are active and which way they go and what their values are. I'm guessing 0400 and OC00 are where those EEPROMs are actually mapped into memory. I'm not sure what these wires were, were for, of course, but they do seem to run to about where the dip switches and where those open cavity sockets were, so they're probably bringing signals over to the main controller chips from there. For what purpose? I couldn't guess. As we look at the empty backplane now, you can see it's actually two backplanes welded together, not welded, bolted together, and uh, each one has five slots for a total of ten. Now, I'm guessing you could buy the five slot expansion bay, and I'm sure a lot of people did that. But if you wanted to go beyond those five to go to a 10 like this, it took a lot of interconnects on the back, as you can see. That all webbing of white wires there is all hand soldered connections between uh, the two halves. And the thing is, the bottom port and the top port are not exactly the same pinout. That's why you see some of the wires ran down even below that. Up here in the middle, we've got all of our power inputs. We've got 8 volt unregulated, which turns into 5 volt regulated ground, a 12 volt regulated, which is produced from a 16 volt unregulated. I don't have any unregulated power supply, so I've been supplying uh, 8 and 16 through these little banana plug adapters that you see here. I'm also supplying a regulated 5 for the Kim 1, so it's actually three power supplies. As we take a final flyover of the boards here, I'll take an opportunity to remind you to please like, and if you're interested in seeing some of these components up and running as I work on them going forward, please remember to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it! Subscribe.